All right, we are continuing our our series, uh, Dream to Destiny. We're talking about every person has a dream. Every person has a destiny. Listen to me. You have a destiny from God. It's as important for you to fulfill your destiny as it is for anyone. Most people, though, live with the dream instead of in the destiny. And there is one major reason, please hear this, that stops people from fulfilling the destiny God has for their lives. I can put it in one word, character. Character. As a matter of fact, many people never fulfill the destiny God has for them simply because their character will not support the destiny. God will actually not allow them to reach that destiny because they're not ready to, to, to fulfill it or to carry the responsibility of the destiny. So, we're looking at the life of Joseph. Joseph had a dream from God. Then he stepped into his destiny. When he had a dream when he was 17. He stepped into the destiny when he was 30. He actually did not fulfill his destiny until he was in his 40s. But it was a process. But he had to pass 10 character tests. And that's what we're going through. And it's in a book called Dream to Destiny. But I want you to think about what is it in my character God is trying to to help and to shape so that I can reach the destiny God has for me, all right? So turn to Genesis chapter 37, and this week we're going to talk about the pit test, all right? We talked about the pride test, now we're going to talk about the pit test. So uh, look at uh, Genesis chapter 37, beginning of verse 13. 13, verse 13, and Israel, that's the same name as Jacob, Joseph's father, said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. Now I want you to As you read the Bible, I want you to get in the habit of seeing if things jump off the page. I want you to notice it says a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. In other words, he didn't go up to the man and ask. He was just wandering. Now, we know he was a dreamer, but I I think he was a daydreamer too. Uh, And you you have to give him a little grace because he's only 17 years old. So, um, Anyway, he's, 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 he's just wandering. He's just wandering in a field. And, and the man said to him, uh, what are you seeking? Uh, so he said to him, I'm seeking my brothers. I think he also, he meant, thanks for reminding me. Uh, <laughs> Please tell me why, where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they've departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. That's in Alabama. <laughs> Verse 18, now when they saw him afar off, even even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming, therefore let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. We're going to talk about the pit test. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, who's the firstborn, by the way, the oldest, heard it and he delivered him out of their hands. And said us, said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit. Second time we see the word pit, which is in the wilderness. And do not lay a hand on him. And this, the reason he said it was that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic or his robe, his coat. The tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. So, I want to talk to you about getting out of the pit, all right? And three things I want you to notice about the pit test. Here's number one, the position of the pit. The position of the pit. In other words, what brought you to this position? How did you get in this position? It is a wise thing when we're in the pit to see if we did something to attribute to our circumstances. I'm not talking about condemning now. I'm talking about soul searching. I'm not talking about saying to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Joseph could have easily said, you know, it's not my fault. 
It's my brothers. It's, it's, not, it's not the way that I talk about my dreams. It's not the way I present myself. It's not pride in me. It's envy in them. And that's what many, many people do. When we go through a difficult time, we blame someone else. Listen to me carefully. I'm sorry for what your parents did to you, but get over it. You're 48 years old, man. Do something for God. Stop blaming people. We, we, we live in a blame society. It is amazing to me how many people that I talk to today that say, you know, I didn't understand all the things I'm going through. Now I understand it was my parents' fault. No, it was how you responded. It is not the action that puts us in a pit. It's our reaction to the action. Please hear me. Do some soul searching. His brothers hated him. Why did they hate him? Why didn't he ever think about that? As a matter of fact, think about this. Why is he not with his brothers tending the flock in the first place? Why is he not there? Most theologians believe it's because there was such animosity between his brothers and him that Jacob had to separate them. And then Jacob says, go check on your brothers. Now I want you to just think about this for a moment. He didn't really expect Joseph to check on them. He was trying to develop a relationship with them. The, Joseph was 17 years old. His brothers were older. There are 10 of them, that most of them, nine of them were in their 20s and 30s. Ruby and, Reuben and Simeon were probably in their 40s. They knew how to take care of sheep. They didn't need a 17-year-old coming to check on them. But Jacob thought maybe, maybe Joseph will, will, will uh, conduct himself a little more maturely and everything will be okay. Obviously, we know that's not the case. But how did they know, by the way? When, when, when Joseph, it says, the Bible, verse 18, it says, when he was, they saw him afar off. Even before he came near, they conspired. They saw him a, a long way off. How, how did they know it was him? It was because he was wearing that blasted coat. <laughs> that, that orange, purple, polka dot, you know, whatever it was that you could see for a mile away. He, I, I think he wore it everywhere he went. I think he was proud of it. I think he wore it in Texas in August. And I want you to now draw some similarities. Again, every time we read the Bible, we need to say, God, what are you saying to me through this passage? I want you to think about this. Joseph had his father's favor on him. Guess what? You're a son or a daughter who has your father's favor on you. And Joseph's father gave him a gift. Guess what? Your father gave you a gift. But Joseph was proud of his gift and showed it off every chance he got. How many believers are proud of the gift that God's given them? Here's what I want to say to you. The giver is so much better than the gift. We need to be in love with the giver. But it's amazing to me how many people slip their gift into the conversation. And the reason is it's because we have our identity in our gift, not in that we're a child, a favorite child. And so I'll be talking to people, and they'll just kind of slip it in. They'll just kind of say, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, Pastor Robert, I, I'm a prophet. I feel like saying, I knew that. <laughs> I'm a prophet too. You know, it's just, this is crazy. To, <sighs> why we do that? Why do you have to tell me about your gift? Why do you have to show your coat off? Why can't you just be your father's child? And, and this, this pride, this insecurity, this inferiority is what got Joseph in trouble. It's what gets us in trouble. Now listen carefully because this is, this is strong what I'm about to tell you. He got a gift from his father. We get gifts from our father. But because of his pride, because of his arrogance, listen to me carefully. Listen. He lost his gift. And a lot of people immediately say, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. God would never take the gift back that he gave me. Matter of fact, Romans eleven twenty nine: 29, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, that's not talking about you. It's talking about the Jewish nation. Number two, if you want to use it as an analogy, I'm okay with that, that God's not going to take the gift back because I didn't say that the father, Joseph's father, took his gift back. I said he lost it. Listen to me very carefully. We've seen a lot of high-profile ministers lose their gift because of lack of integrity, lack of character. Now you say, well, what about me? What, what if that's me? What if I've done something? I've, I've lost my gift. Can I ever get it back? Listen, 
Listen, Joseph had one coat. You remember where he went when he finally fulfilled his destiny? Governor of Egypt. (laughs) The second wealthiest man in the world. He had hundreds of coats. Listen, whatever you lose through foolishness, if you'll repent, you can get back, you can get it back a hundredfold. I mean, Joseph had one of those closets that you walk in with a button, and the coach just went by. Now, you might be thinking, well, yeah, but he didn't get this coat back. I'm not so sure he didn't get it back. Because remember, he was restored to a relationship with Jacob. I don't think Jacob ever threw that coat away. And I'll tell you this, here's the most important thing. Whether he got that coat back or not, he got relationship with his father back which was more important than one gift. So that's the position of the pit. What got me in this position? Here's number two, the perspective of the pit. I want us to, to take a perspective and say, what, what, what am I doing and what's God doing in my life? In, in other words, the, the, when I say, what got me in this position, I'm saying, let's get God's perspective on the pit. But when I talk about the perspective now, I'm saying, let's make sure we don't get Satan's perspective. Every time you're in a pit, listen to me, who shows up first, the accuser of the brethren. He will show up and he will begin to condemn you and accuse you. And there is a tremendous difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is specific. Condemnation is general. Conviction is you did this and this, and that's why you're in this pit. Condemnation is you're a bad person, you're a horrible person, you're worse than everyone else, and you'll never do what anything for God, and, you, and you'll never accomplish anything. That's, that's what the enemy does. And God never, please hear this, God never, never condemns you. I, I can't tell you the burden I carry for correct theology. I, I can't tell you. We have the, the least knowledgeable uh, society, body of Christ we've ever had on the earth when it comes to theology. We have absolutely horrible theology. We don't have the basics down anymore. We have a new age, uh, a new generation theology about God, and we are so mixed up about the character of God. Listen to me. God never condemns you. God, condemnation is always from the enemy. If you ever get an ac- accusatory or a condemning thought, it is not from God. And I, I can prove it to you by one verse. I, I wish everybody in the world would memorize the verse after the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16, great verse, not taking anything away from John 3.16. John 3.17 says, God did not, did not, did not, did not did not, I'm going to keep saying it until you get it, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Listen, here's the whole theological reason why God doesn't condemn. God didn't send Jesus to condemn us. We were already condemned. We were born condemned. One man sinned and the world was condemned. That's Romans 5. We were already condemned. God did not send Jesus to condemn us but to save us from from our condemnation. So when I say let's get a perspective, I'm saying let's get God's perspective. Let's not not let the enemy come in. Here's what the enemy does. He's a liar, and he's the father of all lies. Let me say it another way. If Satan is talking, he's lying. If his lips are moving, he's lying. I promise you, he's a liar. Let me show you one of the most famous lies in this story so we can learn from it. Look at verse uh, 31. Genesis 37, verse 31. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, notice what the brothers said. We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. Now watch what Jacob says on his own. A wild beast has devoured him Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Let me ask you a very simple question. Had a wild beast devoured Joseph? No, this was a lie. Now listen, please remember what I'm about to tell you. Satan is such a good liar that he will fabricate evidence to back up his lies. This was fabricated evidence. 
And the bro- most people believe that the, the brothers, because earlier they said, let's tell him this, let's kill him and tell him a wild beast, but they never told their father. They never said a wild beast killed Joseph. They never said that, and we found his body. Or that. They simply said, is that your son's coat? They ripped it up and put blood on it. Is that your son's coat? And Jacob, on his own, came to the conclusion he's been killed by a wild beast. Of course, you know, when you think about it, it really makes you angry at the brothers because Joseph, I mean, Jacob believed this lie for 22 years. 22 years. He didn't know until Joseph was 39 that he wasn't killed by a wild beast. He didn't know he was alive until he was 39 years old. And I think of all the times that he cried himself to sleep in the next room and the brothers listened to their father crying and never walked across the hall to say, it's not true. Your son's alive. It's not true. That's the hardness of sin. But it was a lie. And it was, it was evidence. I'm telling you, God, uh, Satan will do the same thing with you. He'll, he'll fabricate it. He'll say, you're, you're not going to be healed. Look at that report. Yeah, yeah, your life's not going to change. Look at this. You're, you're not going to make it in your business. Look at the, the, the Wall Street Journal. Look, look at this report. Here, here's, his, here's his number one, probably the number one lie he's doing today. Here is probably number one. Uh, you're married to the wrong person. And there's evidence of it right there. Let me give you the evidence. Look, 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 look at how opposite you are. Now, that's, that's an amazing lie to me that anyone ever believed that. Look, look how opposite of you. Of course you're opposite. You don't want to marry someone like you. <laughs> Think about it. You know you. If you married you, you'd kill yourself. <laughs> the whole reason you married her is because she would not like you. <laughs> And here's what happens. Some guy will start going to the gym, and he'll start working out, and he, 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 he kind of enjoys that. That's, that's what he likes to do, and his wife, she's, that's not what she enjoys. And pretty soon he'll see a woman there, and that's what she enjoys. And Satan will say, see, she has the same value as you do. See, she's, she's your perfect match. See, she's perfect. Listen, listen, listen to me, man. Listen to me. It's a lie. It's a lie from the enemy. And he will fabricate evidence. He'll give you evidence at the gym, she's the one for you. And he'll give you evidence at home, she's not the one for you. And you'll say, yeah, but I have, I've, had, I've had men tell me, Robert, let me tell you the signs God's given me. I said, God didn't give you signs for a divorce. Can I say that again? And I know, I know that I preach to, to 50% of our society it has been through divorce, and I never, ever, ever want you to feel condemnation, but I will never back off the truth of God's Word that He believes in the covenant of marriage. We can't back off of that. So don't believe a lie. Don't get Satan's perspective. Look at the position you're in and see what God is saying about it, but don't get Satan's perspective. Here's number three, the purpose of the pit. What is the purpose of the pit? Well, I'm going to tell you what it is and then show it to you right out of Scripture. The purpose of every pit is to get us to cry out to God. The purpose of every pit is to get us to cry out to God. Let me say it another way. What else is there to do in a pit? (laughs) There's nobody else to talk to. I mean, you could walk around and gripe for a while, but eventually you're going to have to say, "Mm, I need God. I'm not getting out of this without God. You know what's amazing to me is we'll get in a pit and, uh, and, and we'll say, Lord, we'll pray about it some, and then we'll, we'll it, well, it's not that big of a pit, and so we'll get out, and in essence, our attitude is like, never mind. Yeah, I don't really need you, God. It's okay. You can go back to whatever you were doing. And then we get in a big pit, and then we say, okay, I really need you this time because I can't do this on my own. Just so you'll know correct theology again, you can't do anything on your own. Every breath comes from God. Every breath comes from God. So we get thrown in a pit. What do we do? We have to cry out to God. Let me show you another guy that got thrown in a pit. Jonah. Remember God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, so he went to Tarshish, which is the opposite, by the way. Okay, it's in the different direction. Jonah 2 verse 1, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord. That's the purpose of the pit. Listen why he cried out. Because of my affliction. The affliction could be a good thing if it gets you to cry out to God. And he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. Sheol is an Old Testament Hebrew word that means the pit. 
and it is translated the pit several times. Out of Sheol, the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Verse 6, you have brought up my life from the pit. See, I, I'm wondering if for the first for the first few hours or whatever. Joseph was in the pit, I wonder if he was rehearsing how bad his brothers were and how good he was. You know, God, I just can't believe this, and here these guys have done this to me, and you know, God, I got that dream about these guys bowing down to me, you know. I mean, they're supposed to be bowing down, and they, you know, I, God, I know you're going to get them for what they did to me. And I'm wondering if his prayers went along those lines, and after a while he started thinking, you know, I'm probably cost some of this myself, maybe just a little, God. I just, just wanted to admit that to you while I was talking to you. I mean, maybe a little bit of this I brought on myself. Probably after a few hours, he's down on his knees. Oh, God, I did it. It's me. I'm the one that's wrong. It's me. And I think he, something happened to him in that pit that changed his life. And I think when that happened, is when Judah got the idea of pulling him up out of the pit, saw the Midianite traders and said, let's sell him. Let's not kill him, let's sell him. And so that's when things begin to change for him. Now, let me show you just a couple of things that happened that are types and shadows. Anytime you read the Old Testament, it's true. It happened literally, but it's a type and a shadow of something. Thus, it, 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 it's for our instruction according to 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, Genesis 37 verse 22 says, And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him. Now, this is the reason that he said it. That he might deliver him, notice these words, deliver him, out of their hands, and bring him back to his father. Now, let me tell you something about Reuben. Reuben's the firstborn. 
By the way, remember Joseph was the favorite son. Everybody knew that. Reuben should have been the favorite son. And yet here he is looking out for him and protecting him. Now, remember that Reuben was the firstborn. Colossians 1 tells us Jesus is the firstborn of God, the firstborn among many brethren, the firstborn. So the firstborn wants to deliver Joseph out of this pit. And listen to why he says, two reasons, to deliver him and to bring him back to the Father. Okay, so try to remember this. The purpose of every pit is to deliver us and bring us back to the Father. That's the purpose of every pit. The purpose of every pit is to set us free from those things that are holding us in bondage and bring us into closer relationship. Genesis 41. Genesis chapter 41, and we're continuing our, our series, Dream to Destiny. And uh, this is uh, the seventh message in the series of ten. So we have eight, nine, ten after this. And let me just give you a quick review of what we've covered. We've covered the pride test, which is the test we take when the dream comes. And then we've covered the pit test, which is the test we take when the enemy comes against us. We covered the palace test, which is how well can we steward what belongs to someone else. And obviously everything we have belongs to the Lord. We covered the uh, purity test, how well can we steward our own body. We covered the prison test is uh, how do we respond when we do the right thing but bad things happen to us or the wrong thing happens to us. We covered the prophetic test of how are we allowing God's Word to mold us for the prophecy over our lives. And this week is the power test. The power test. The power test happens when we step into God's destiny for our life. This happened in Joseph's life when he was 30 years old. Pharaoh had two dreams, and Joseph interpreted those dreams and stepped into his destiny. Now, he hasn't fulfilled his destiny yet, so I want you to understand, even if you're walking in the destiny God has for you, we're still taking tests. All of us are still taking these tests. But this is the first test, I believe, that we take when we step into the destiny God has on our life. So, Genesis 41, we're going to skip around a little bit but you'll get the gist of the story. This is right after uh, Pharaoh's two dreams in verses 1 through 7, list his dreams. Now look at verse 8. Genesis 41, verse 8. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. That's speaking of Pharaoh. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. In other words, he now tells him about Joseph. Look at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him quickly. It's very important to understand the power test comes quickly. Out of the dungeon and he shaved, changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. Verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Notice even an unbeliever recognized God's Spirit. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck, and he had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Now, I just want you to notice that Joseph goes to sleep in the prison, wakes up in the prison, gets called to the palace, and the next day wakes up in the palace. Promotion... I believe can come in one day. 
in one day you can step into your destiny. And I want you to see that the, uh, all of these tests we've been going through, for instance, the pride test is how we respond to the dream. The power test is how we respond to the destiny. Many, many people don't understand you will be tested by success. It is one of the tests that many, many people fail. They can handle the prison test. They can handle the test of adversity. But when the test of success comes, they're not ready for that success. So I want to talk about power a little bit today, all right? And three points, but I, have, I, I phrase them in, in, as questions, all right? So here's the number one question. From where does power come? From where does power come? come. Psalm 62 verse 11 says, God has spoken once, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God. All power comes from God. Romans 14 says, there is no power in existence, no authority that is not set up by God. One of my favorite scriptures is when uh, Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Pilate says this, John 19, verses 10 and 11. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? In other words, you're not going to answer me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Now, one of the reasons this is one of my favorite scriptures is because it has to be the funniest scripture in the Bible. Because he's saying to the creator of the universe... Do you not know I have power over you? I am surprised Jesus didn't go, <laughs> uh, you know. He said, Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. And let me tell you a little bit about the power test. The power test is recognizing that God's blessing and God's power is on our lives as we respond and do the right thing. In other words, the power test is not going either way that I, I have done all this, that my success is because of me, nor is it going the other way to say, well, it's just all God. It's understanding that I've worked very, very hard to, to, to have the success that I have, yet God's blessed me. And without the blessing of God, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. See, the way you pass the power test is you understand that we work hard, we respond to God's voice, but it's still God's power and God's authority. All power comes from God. And I'll tell you something else also. A lot of people don't realize this. The desire for power comes from God. Did you know that? Now, Satan has twisted it and caused it to be a selfish and a self-centered desire, but the original Pure desire for power comes from God. Do you realize you were created?
in the image of an all-powerful God. And when you understand what power is for, that power is not for our good, but power is to help people. You realize why God gave Joseph power? God gave Joseph power to feed multitudes. God gave Joseph power so that God could bless people. And Joseph understood that, and he used his power correctly. So when we understand there is a right desire for power, if you don't think that every person has a desire for power, just watch little girls playing with baby dolls. My, my, we would walk by our daughter's room, and she'd have those baby dolls set up, and she'd have a piece of paper and a crayon in front of them, and she was telling them what to do, and when they didn't do it, she'd just turn them over and spank them real good, and she, she, she was in charge. And she was the youngest in our family. I'll tell you another way you can see power. Uh, get a dog and watch how the youngest child, the youngest child finally has someone to boss around. <laughs> Why? Because there is a natural desire for power and authority that God gives us. All power and even the right desire for power comes from God. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be great in the kingdom. He didn't say that uh, he, he's wrong and he has bad motives. He said, if anyone desires to be great in the kingdom, let him be the servant of all. In other words, it's not wrong to desire to be great in the kingdom. Uh, Timothy and Titus says, if any man desires the office of a bishop or an overseer, an elder, he desires a good thing. If you desire power for the right reason, it's a good thing. So all power comes from God. Here's number two. To whom does power come? To whom does power come? James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let me give you another reason, no, another wording for lift you up. He'll give you power. He'll give you authority, responsibility. 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6, likewise, you younger people submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Gives, God gives grace to the humble. And grace, we know one aspect of grace, is an enabling or an empowering. That's what grace is. It's not just forgiveness, but it is an empowering. We could never walk a holy life without the empowerment of God. So who does he give power or empowerment to but to the humble? So it's very simple. I'm asking questions. Where does power come? Uh, from where does power come? Comes from God. To whom does power come? Comes to the humble. Um, it's amazing to me to watch how we're all real humble when we start out at something, but after we do it for a while, we kind of lose our humility about it, you know? Like the, the life group leader says, hey, next week I'm going to be out of town. I, I'd like for you to teach the lesson. Oh, oh my goodness, I can't, I can't do that. I just, I, no, 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 I really, I prayed about it, and I, I really think you're, you're doing it. And, and, and uh, it's very simple, and it's laid out, and oh, I'll tell you. And then all week we're just nervous, and we just can't hardly sleep, and we just get so nervous. And then we share the life group lesson. And because of our humility, God just shows up, and he lifts us up for his purposes, and he blesses us. And then someone says afterwards, boy, you did a good job. Yeah, I, I thought I'd be good at this. It just all of a sudden changes. Please understand, there is a humility that God works in us, and the lower we put ourselves, the higher God puts us. Think about this. Pride is so ugly. Have you ever been around a prideful person? I mean, it's just ugly, isn't it? And it's just so repulsive. Yeah, have you ever been around someone who you kind of wanted to meet, you respected this person, this person has been very successful, and all of a sudden you get to meet the person, spend some time, and the person's arrogant. And, and, you, and you just think to yourself, ooh, man, I don't want to ever be around that person again. Or have you ever been around a person who's been very successful and accomplished a lot, and you get to spend some time with the person, and all of a sudden you think, wow, look at the humility and, and, and what you're attracted to that person. And you want to be around that person more, right? And, or, or, and I'll tell you something that really gets me. Have you ever known someone that hasn't accomplished anything and hasn't been successful at all and is still prideful? That's just silly. <laughs> Pride is foolish, and it looks foolish, right? 
And I'll tell you a story about me. Um, years and years ago, I was probably in my 20s. I know I was in my 20s. And um, uh, the, the, the thing then was, uh, uh, I don't know why, we just kind of went through a phase. This was in the 80s. Uh, of of uh, lizard skin shoes. Any of you remember lizard skin shoes? I don't know if they're still in or not. If you have some, don't feel bad because I'm talking about it. But anyway, um, and it, if you were successful, you had lizard skin shoes, you know, if you were a, a man. And uh, so, I, of course, I couldn't afford them. They were about twice my house payments, you know. And so, um, but I, this friend of mine bought some and they were too small for him. And so he gave them to me. And uh, truth be told, they were too small for me, but I wore them. And uh, so... <laughs> I just felt like I was, that people, all of a sudden I made it. People just thought, man, that he's successful and he's rich and, you know, and so I, so one morning I decided on a Saturday morning to go to the car wash and get them shined, you know, get my Ford Fairlane washed. And, um, how many of you remember Ford Fairlane? I'm, I'm telling the truth. We had a, okay. So anyway, you young people, you have no clue what I'm talking about. So but I go to the car wash and I get my shoes shine and then I got up and I was walking down that long corridor where the windows are and everybody's standing. It's a Saturday morning. It's, it's packed. Everybody's standing at the windows and they're watching the car. But when I would walk by, they would kind of, you know, kind of turn around like this and every one of them just looked down and then they would watch as I walked by. And I just thought, man. They think I am someone important. This is just so wonderful. And when I got down to the end of the hall, after walking down the end of the hall and everyone looking at me, I looked down to see how nice my shoes looked. And the guy that had shined them had rolled up my pants legs like this. And I was just walking there. Now, my point is that pride looks foolish. <laughs> so to whom does power come? It comes to the humble. And here's point number three. Why does power come? Why does God give his power? Listen, think about this. Or share his power with someone. Acts 10.38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. God gives power to help people. God gives power because he loves people, and he wants to see people help. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, though. You've you got you to gotta catch this. God has all the resources in the world, right? Everyone agree with that? God owns everything in the world. Well, and out of this world for that matter. He owns Mars too. I don't, I don't know if you know, but he owns Mars. So God owns everything, everything. Oh, here's all the resources. Over here are all the hurting people. All the people that need to be fed, all the hungry people, all the hurting people, all the people that need the gospel preached to them, all the missionaries that need to be sent, all the church buildings that need to be built, all the ministries that need to be supported. Here, here, all the, all the needs over here, okay? Over here, all the resources. And if you want to think about it this way, all the, all the supply and all the demand, if you want to use a business analogy, right? Have you ever thought about it this way? What's in the middle? You are. You are. And God is simply looking for humble stewards that he can channel his resources and his power through. He wants to get all, he wants to, to get all of these resources and all of this power and all of this blessing to all of this need. But he works through people. And his power is for good. His power is to help people. God's heart is for people. Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18 says, Don't say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may, watch this, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Why does God give power? Here's the reason, that he may establish his covenant. 
that people can come into the new covenant of grace with Jesus Christ. I've heard this scripture quoted so much, you know, it's God who gives power to give wealth. It's God who gives power to get wealth. Yeah, why? So you can have a nicer car? No, so he can establish his covenant with people. So he can bless people, so he can use you. He wants to bless you so you can bless others. It's all through scripture. God wants to, why would God give us such a nice building? Why? So we can say, look how big and nice our building is. No, so we can help more people. It's always to establish his covenant. Power, and it's wonderful when people who have been given power use their power to help people. That's what Joseph did. That's what Joseph did. Uh, a few years ago, um, we were very, very small. We had, well, I guess we were a little larger, but we had like five services a weekend at, at, at one campus. And uh, so on, on the first Saturday evening service, some people in the church brought a lady to me and said, uh, this so-and-so and introduced me. She and her husband had been missionaries to Mexico for 40 years, 40 years. And so I'm talking to her and I said, is there anything I can, I can pray with you about? And she said, yeah. She said, um, two months ago, uh, I was, something happened with our visas and I was ordered to leave Mexico after 40 years. And my husband uh, has to, had to stay. And there's something wrong, and they won't let him out, and they won't let me back in. So we've been apart for two months. Uh, could you pray about that? Well, we, we have a man in our church named Juan Hernandez that ran the campaign for Vicente Fox to be elected president. And at that time, Vicente Fox was president. As a matter of fact, President Fox was the first president of Mexico not elected from the Communist Party in 72 years. And Juan led him to Jesus Christ, and he's a believer. And then Juan led 13 out of 24 cabinet members to Christ, and a member of our church. And uh, so uh, I thought to myself, hey, maybe Juan could, could do something to help. So I said, give me your name and your number, your information, your contact info. There's someone in our church, and I think he might be able to help. So the next service, this couple came up to me, and they introduced themselves, and his name's Jose, and he said, I'm Juan Hernandez's cousin. And I said, oh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with Juan. I don't know if he's in town or not this weekend. And um, I said, there's, and so I told him the story. I said, there's a lady, there's a problem with the visa, and um, so that's why I'm trying to talk to Juan. And Jose said, I will take care of it. And uh, I said, um, Really? And uh, I said, are you, what, are you, do you have some contacts? He said, I'm the minister of immigration for Mexico. <laughs> I said, really? And so then I, I thought, well, you know, it's the first time I've ever met the guy, you know, and I don't want to impose. So I said, well, listen, I said, you know, uh, I mean, if, if you run into any problems, you know, I, you know, I was just trying to kind of let him off the hook. And I'll never forget, he looked me right now and he said, I will not run into any problems. I will take care of it. He understood the power that he had. He also understood what his power was for. And this was on Sunday, uh, that, that weekend, on Monday, he had his visa. And he came home, and they had a, and, and within a year, after them being home and having a furlough, the husband went to be with the Lord. And I remember thinking about how God had arranged for them to be together that last year of his life. But here's what I want to say to you. I feel like I have a prophetic word for you. Remember where all power comes from. All power comes from God. So I, I would like to say something to each of you right now. This is from the Lord. Here's what God would like to say to you. I will not have any problems. I will take care of it. I will take care of it. Whatever you're going through right now, he has all power and he'll take care of it. God gave Joseph power so he could help people. God's heart is for people. And God will invest his power in you so that you can be a blessing to people. But in the same way that I said God's heart is for people, I want you to hear this today. 